Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest, Carla Harris, is vice chairman of wealth management and senior client advisor at Morgan Stanley, not to mention a celebrated gospel singer, speaker, and author. Carla began her career at a time when few of her colleagues were African-American or women and carved her own career path. Today, she oversees Morgan Stanley's multicultural client strategy and helped build the company's multicultural innovation lab an accelerator program for innovative tech startups led by multicultural entrepreneurs. Carla was appointed by President Barack Obama to chair the National Women's Business Council and is a member of the boards for Harvard University and Walmart. Wow. In our conversation today, Carla shares what she's learned about pathways to career success. We talk about the difference between mentors and sponsors, how to get a sponsor, and how she thinks about work-life balance differently than you'd think. Carla and I also share the stage and have for several years in November at one of my favorite events of the year, Linkage's Women in Leadership Institute. Attend live or in person in Orlando. Just check out linkageinc.com for details. All right, get ready for some of Carla's pearls. Here's my conversation with the one and only Carla Harris. Carla Harris, this is fun. I mean, you and I have spoken at events together. We've connected over time. I have so much admiration for you. You're an amazing woman who serves so many people. So thank you for joining this conversation. This will be fun. Well, you are most welcome, Molly. We are certainly kindred spirits, and it's been fun, you know, being out there on, on the road with you and being in the same places and uh, and being able to hopefully add value where we could. So I'm excited to have this conversation with you. So, Carla, who are the early influencers, right, in your life? And how would you describe yourself, the Carla Harris, when you were younger? Yes. Okay. So early influences, that's easy. I'd have to say it was my mother, father, and paternal grandmother, because they all sort of gave me this sense of delivering excellence all the time, anywhere, anytime, just because you could. And they each had a different angle on it. Like my grandmother was the first female entrepreneur that I ever met, and she was no nonsense, no question about it. But she would say things to me, Molly, like, baby, whatever you be, be good at it. Right. And so, again, that was the message of if you're going to bother, make sure you're the best. And she would even say, if you're going to be the best, if you want to be a garbage man, I don't care, but be the best garbage man slash garbage woman slinging on the back of that truck. You know, and so, again, this this whole concept of whatever you're going to endeavor, make sure you give it your all. My dad was the same way. You know, if I if I came home with a B, he was upset. It was like, what, what happened to the A? Why didn't you get the A? You got one job and your job is to get your lesson. Right. And that means that translates into A's. Um, and my mom would say things to me like, um, you know, what? whatever you do, be so outstanding, there's no debate. And frankly, Molly, I look back now, and that was her way of telling me that there were inequities in the world. Because she would say, listen, if you want the A, be so outstanding, go get the A plus. So that way, if you get shaved a little bit, you'll still have the A. And, I, and again, as a kid, you're, you're, you're not quite sure what that means, but if you want the A, you better go for the A plus. So to make sure you get an A, at all costs, have an A on that report card. Whereas now I realize what she was saying is that you're not going to always get your due. You're not going to always get what you deserve. But if you're so outstanding, it's going to be really hard for people not to give you what what you deserve or you'll get part of it. Yeah. I mean, I think that translates so much into the athlete space, right? I mean, I used to talk to my guys and, and gals about that, right? Be so good. Put up such crazy good numbers that it's hard for them not to play you. It's impossible for them not to put you on the field or the court, right? Be that A plus. You know, when did you start, Carla, to aspire to a career in finance? And, you know, if you weren't in finance, right, what do you think, what would Carla Harris be doing? 
<laughs> well, Carla Harris would probably be doing a lot of what I'm doing now in terms of, of public speaking in some way that would have probably come back around. But I will tell you that from um, you know my early professional pursuits, I might have been a lawyer because that's exactly what I uh, thought I was going to do when I walked on to Harvard. But what really ignited the passion around finance was the summer after my sophomore year. I had my first internship um, in finance um, in New York City on Wall Street. And it was through a program called SEO. And I and I tease the SEO folks all the time that that was the summer that changed the trajectory of my life. Because all of a sudden, Molly, it was that summer that I realized that finance held a lot of the things that I found attractive in the law. The, what I didn't know at 19 years old, which is when I had that internship, was that I wanted to have a lot of responsibility very early on. I wanted to be able to call the shots in my life. And I wanted to make a lot of money. And at that point, growing up black in the South, if you were in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, if you were smart, people pushed you into one of three directions. One, be a teacher. Two, be a nurse or a doctor. Or three, uh, be a lawyer. And because I like to argue my points, people in my family, my friends said, oh, you're going to be a lawyer. And oh, by the way, Molly, I loved Perry Mason, the original Perry Mason with Raymond Burr. Uh, loved myself some Perry Mason, wanted to have my own Della and my own Paul, if you remember that show. And um, and, I, and I will tell you that, uh, that that's what I thought I was going to do. And all of a sudden that summer in finance, I realized, wow, you know, these folks have a lot of responsibility early on because there I was at 19, brand spanking new in it as an intern in the summer. And I was working on analysis from which people were making decisions to issue hundreds of millions of dollars of bonds based on my work. Number two, I realized, and so that was a lot of responsibility early on. It was also that summer, I realized that the lawyers don't call the shots, the business people call the shots, and the lawyers help you get it done within the context of the law. And then the third thing is I say, oh, they make, they make a lot of money doing this thing, right? So I said, wait a minute. And I'll tell you the the thing that probably pushed it over the edge, Molly, was the fact that I did not see a lot of women and I did not see a lot of people of color uh, in the business. And I thought, wait a minute, why not? The work is not that hard. It's not that difficult. And I'm negatively motivated. So when you tell me I can't do something, I'm all over it. And so that made it. And the fact that somehow this thing was in a way prohibitive or were hard, were hard, was hard for people of color to get to, hard for women to get to, that made it even more attractive. Mm-hmm. I've heard you talk about that before, right? Being negatively motivated. If, if someone tells you that you can't do it, right? It is on, right? Carla's like, it is on. And are there other examples in your life like that where that showed up for you, where somebody said, no, you can't, and, and here you are? Oh, sure. There were, there were uh, lots of things. I'll never forget, even in my own career, there was a, there was a guy who, I, I will tell you, I do think he was well-meaning at the time. He said to me in my career, he said, Look, and he saw me working so hard and trying so hard. He, he took me to the side one day and he said, I just want to tell you, they're never going to promote you to manager director. That's never going to happen. And, and at that moment, my, you know, I think I was so taken aback. I was like, really? What, what do you mean? How, how can you say that? No, you, are you saying no matter what I do, no matter how many deals I do, no matter how great the client feels, that is never going to happen. I don't understand. How, how, do, how does anybody know what I'm going to do in the future? What are you saying? And I think at that time, he realized, oh my gosh, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and I, I mean, I can repeat this to you now because he's he's unfortunately, you know, passed away. God rest his soul. But I think he was trying to trying to tell me, you're killing yourself, and it's and for nothing. And and my response was truly naive, um, and I didn't get it at the moment. And I, you know, but that that obviously pushed that button to work even harder, try even harder, show him even more, right? And of course, it all came to pass that I did make manager director. I went on to be uh, successful and continue to be successful. But it just goes to show you that, um, you know, that thing, if you if you have that trigger that, that really makes you drive, um, and un, unbeknownst to him, he hit it, and it was on. It was on. It, does that still drive you today, Carla? Yeah. I would tell you it's, it still drives me today. I don't I don't have as many examples of that kind of negative stimuli and I am 
equally as excited by positive stimuli to really go for something. Uh, but even even today, uh, now I'll tell you what's different. Today, I am much more measured in my reaction. So when I can feel that negative stimulation poking me, now I say, is it worth expending your energy on this? Or is it something that you should let go because energy expended, as you well know, Molly, energy expended is energy expended, right? And so you should make sure that you are spending it where it's going to make the biggest impact, not as a reaction to something that is that actually could be rooted as an emotional reaction. No question. Absolutely. Managing our energy is, it's massive. It's everything. And managing your emotions. Uh, yes, it, absolutely. No question. I always talk about how do, how do we in those moments, right, shift from defensiveness to get to get really curious, right? Is this where I want to put my energy? Is this better than the problem it's creating, right? All those all those things. You know, uh, Carla, when you were looking around Wall Street, right, you obviously didn't see a whole lot of people who look like you. You didn't see a lot of people of color, of you know, a women. Certainly, you know, the, that that I can relate to as far as being a woman uh, in, in, a, in a male-dominated space. You know, representation, right, it matters. So, so what, what was it like for you, right, navigating all of that, right, and carving your own seat, you know, at the table? Yeah, I'll tell you, that was, not, that was something that never intimidated me, uh, Molly. Um, and in fact, it's one of, the, I think, the key differentiators um, generationally, for uh, boomers and older Xers and millennials and Zers. And I say this all the time um, as I'm speaking about, you know, being a leader in an environment where you are trying to manage and retain uh, millennial talent. If you're a boomer, it was par for the course that you, if you were a woman or a person of color, you were going to be the first and the only in many rooms. So you needed to be comfortable with that before you ever got started. If you weren't comfortable with that, then don't don't even think about it because there weren't a lot of people that went before you in some of these spaces. So that that never intimidated me. That was just like a given, which is very different than for millennials and Zers who I think have been brought up in an environment where they really do need to see somebody like them, that representation that you're asking about, they need to see that in order for them to believe that that is a place that they could go, should go, and would be able to thrive. Um, and so that that didn't scare me at all. In fact, it, it too was a motivating factor uh, to, you know, go do that thing for the first time, and then boom, that was done. So there was no reason for anyone ever to say that somebody else like me couldn't do it. It was over. It was done. <laughs> so what's the problem? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. You know, can you talk a little bit about the the Multicultural Innovation Lab, right? The work that you're doing there and and why it's so important. I tell you, I am very excited about that. It's one of the things that I'm, I'm quite proud of in, in my current pursuits. And the Multicultural Innovation Lab at Morgan Stanley is an in-house accelerator. So it's an accelerator like any of the ones that you hear out uh, in the Valley. Um, and we bring in 10 companies per year up until this year. We're going to do two cohorts. So we'll bring in 20 companies per year that have been founded by women and or people of color. And we give them three things. We give them cash, like any other accelerator, in exchange for a single digit percentage of the business. We give them six months of content that is designed to help them to develop, evolve from being a founder to a CEO, because as you know, there is a difference. Um, and we also give them uh, connections to some of our larger investment banking clients for the purpose of, of scaling their business and advancing the scaling of their business. And the reason why it's so important, because as you know, Molly, women get 4% or less of traditional VC dollars and people of color get somewhere between one and 2%, depending on your sources. And there's a huge inequity in the distribution of capital to these, these demographics. And I always say, whenever there's that kind of uh, market inefficiency, there's a huge commercial opportunity. So A, the reason you want to go there is if you are the investor or the asset allocator, huge commercial opportunity. B, if you care about what's going on and having equity in our broader economic ecosystem, then it's about closing the gap. Uh, for women and people of color with respect to having access to that capital. So that's the reason that we we created the lab. And the reason I like it in the lab format, Molly, as opposed to just 
talking about giving these companies money is that while these founders are great, they're they're innovative. In many cases, they're just frankly ingenious. Um, they are early stage. They're 30. They're 35. They might be 38. They might be 28. And they have not been in a context where they have seen they have seen how multi billion dollar organizations are built, how cultures are built, how you hire the right people, especially those early hires. And they need a little bit more than just capital. So as a, a leading global investment bank that actually takes companies public or does amazing M and A transactions, we know what the end game looks like. So if this is where you're trying to get to we can actually iterate backwards and give you all the building blocks that you need in order to get to that end game. You know, it's it's incredible, right? And 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 you have, I mean, Carla, you're an incredibly humble woman, I know, but you have been described, right, as one of the most powerful women on what one of the most powerful people, excuse me, on Wall Street. You know, what's what's your relationship with the word power, right? And how and how do you think about the responsibility, right, that comes with that power, that influence? Yeah, I tell you, I do think that those of us who have been given any kind of assets like power or money or access, um, that we do have a responsibility to give that to other people. Uh, we are all standing on somebody else's shoulders. I don't care who you are, and I don't care whether you are conscious of it or you're unconscious. Trust me, somebody has helped you get to the place where you are, right? And so, therefore, I think it's important to to do that for other people. And I've been on record, Molly, as saying that the way to grow your power is, in fact, to give it away. And I believe, and you know, my my mom, one of my mantras is, "He gives," meaning the good Lord above. He gives, I get, I give. And as that circle goes around again, it gets more and more powerful every time that goes around. So that's how I try to live it. Power is the ability to get things done. And that is either to connect people or to create something or to drive something. It's getting something done either by your own hand or influencing somebody else's hand to get it done. Serving and using that to to serve and solve. That's right. And support others. You know, was there a defining moment in, in your career that changed everything for you, Carla? Was there moments like that? Was there a moment like that? You know, I, I can't tell you that it was a moment. It was a collection of, of things. And I, I would argue that it was a maturation po- process. You know, obviously this pandemic has given us all an opportunity to pause and, and reflect. And I've reflected over my three decades uh, on Wall Street. And, and now it, it's almost like watching a television show to see how it, it, it unfolded. And at the time, you know, as you were going through those tough times and those challenges, you know, you didn't, you didn't, you couldn't necessarily see how things were going to end up. But one thing I can say for sure, whoever came up with the advice of just put one foot in front of the other, keep going, uh, was great, great advice. Um, and I have a friend, a good friend who used to say, if you feel like you're going through hell, whatever you do, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because then you'll just stay there, right? There Keep go. going. <laughs> I love it. It's so true. You know, you you say the the most important relationship you have in your professional life is, is a sponsor. You talk about this a lot. And by the way, for our listeners who haven't listened, Carla's TED Talk on this is something you need to listen to. It's it's powerful. What's a sponsor? You know, can you maybe walk folks through that? And and how is it different, right, from a mentor? Yes, the the sponsor is the person who's carrying your paper into the room. That room where all of the important decisions about your career will be made. That room where you are not present. That is the room where they are deciding on if you get a promotion. If you get the next big assignment, uh, what your compensation should be. You are never in those rooms when those decisions are being made. Somebody is speaking on your behalf that you get the promotion, you get the great bonus, you get the next great opportunity. That is the sponsor. That is the person that is spending their valuable political and social capital on you. The mentor on the excuse me, on the other hand, is the person that you can tell the good, the bad, and the ugly to. This is the person that you share the intimate details of your career with, your fears, your concerns, your mistakes, your triumphs, your strategies. I'm in this box. I want to be in this box. Who do I work and how do I get there? So the mentor, by definition, needs to know you very well, uh, and there needs to be somebody that you trust. 
if you do not think that the person you are calling your mentor will keep your conversation in confidence or um, that will have you as their one agenda item when they're talking to you, if you don't think that person will do that, then by all means, they can't be your mentor. They can be an advisor so they can answer some questions for you. But the mentor is somebody you need to trust that has your best interests at heart. And when they're speaking at you, speaking to you, there is only one agenda item, and that is you. So I tell people all the time, your mentor does not need to be within your organization, but your sponsor must be within your organization. They must have a seat at a decision-making table, and they must have the power in that room to get it, whatever it is for you, to get it done for you. So that's the fundamental difference between the mentor and the sponsor. And so I'm thinking about people who are listening going, yikes, right? Like, man, I... I don't know if I have a sponsor, right? Like, how do I get one, right? What advice do you have on how to approach kind of those types of conversations? Yes, thank you for that question, because I get that question all the time. The way that you get a sponsor is as follows. Study your organization for two weeks. Just take a look at the organization. Who has a a seat at the decision-making table? And if you can't tell who has a seat at the decision-making table, ask someone. I'll tell you, Molly, that that was the easiest thing for me to do. And I didn't know it. For years, I walked around wondering who was on the promotion committee, who was on the promotion committee. One day, I asked another manager director who happened to be a woman. I said, who is on the promotion committee? And she said, come here for a second. So we sat down in a conference room. Not only did she tell me who was on the promotion committee, she even laid out a schematic and say, here's the table. This one sits next to this one. This one sits next to that one. You know, she just laid it all out. So first of all, find out who has a seat on the decision-making table in your organization. The next thing you want to observe is who does not have a seat at the decision-making table, but yet are key influencers to those people who are in that room at that table. And then the third thing you want to observe, who are the toxic people? So now you write all of that down on one piece of paper. Second piece of paper, now you say, of the people that have a seat at the decision-making table are who are key influencers, how many people have visibility into my work? They don't have to be my direct boss or in my direct line, but they see my work some kind of way because they touch my department or they touch my seat or whatever. But who has exposure to my work? The reason why this is critical, Molly, is because Your sponsor has to be the person pounding the table on your behalf behind closed doors. And if people in the room Mm -hmm. know that they have no visibility into your work, they won't have any credibility, right? So you now need to say of all the people that I know have a seat at the table or who are key influencers, who has visibility into my work? That's your second piece of paper. Now your third piece of paper, everybody who's on that second sheet Now you pick two or three people and you say, here are the people that I'm going to try to increase my interaction with so that I can form a sponsor, sponsoree relationship. Either it will happen naturally, they'll just take me up under their wing, or I will have interacted with them so much such that I will have a relationship and I can ask them to be a sponsor in a formal sense. That's how you do it. In just a minute, we'll get back to the conversation. But first, I want to share a free resource for you. Through this podcast, I've had the opportunity to connect with more than 100 leaders, championship coaches, elite athletes, business leaders, and thought leaders. I've learned so many valuable insights from these conversations that I decided to distill it down into seven mindset shifts that can help you reimagine your role as a leader. You'll also get a playbook with exercises to help you put these principles into action. To get your free playbook, just go to mollyfletcher.com backslash mindset shifts. Again, that's mollyfletcher.com backslash mindset shifts. Now back to the show. And Carl, you've been, you know, on the other side of this, right? So looking at it from... From your angle, right, how do you decide whether that's a relationship that you want to enter into from your side? Well, I'll tell you that when I am choosing somebody to sponsor, it's usually, Molly, it's somebody that I've had some interaction with or I've observed 
uh, quite a lot. Um, and I'm making a decision as to whether or not my voice is going to be more powerful with that person versus maybe somebody else or whether or not in that context, I actually have enough juice to get two or three people done, if you will. So I try to make the decision on where I think I'm going to have the greatest value. And, and you just said it, right, your voice, right, and, and, the, and the power and that you talk about that a lot, about the power of your voice. You know, you're on the other side of the table now, right? You're different than the, than the young intern, clearly. And, 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 and you're that person, right, in the room making decisions about another person's future. How do you use your voice now, right, in that, in that context? Yeah, a lot of times I, I try to ask the questions that will educate in the room. Right. So I might say something like, why are we making this decision or how are we thinking about that? Or we want to make sure that we're being equitable in how we're talking about these folks. So if we put them all on the same, uh, you know, on, on, on the same uh, plane, then we would be asking these four questions. And if you're going to ask these four questions, then how would they measure up? So I try to be the voice in the room that can, you know, squeeze out a little bias, if you will, or that can be innovative. Have we thought enough out of the box? You know, what happens if we give it to this person? They probably won't fail. You know, or why are we even thinking that they might? Or what's the downside if they do? By asking some of those questions that kind of opens up the room a little bit is what I think my primary role should be at this stage of the game. You know, Carla, you talk about Carla's pearls, right? I love these. You clearly feel a responsibility, you know, given your world, given what you've done. But you feel this re- remarkable responsibility to share your wisdom, to share your, you know, Carlos Pearls, which I love, with others. Why, why is that? Well, because, you know, Molly, I remember those days of feeling confused or, or wondering, um, you know, is this the right thing to do? Or am I thinking about this the right way? And, you know, clarity is a very valuable thing. And affirmation is another. And, and like I said earlier, I think, you know, to, as the Bible says, to whom much has been given, much is required. And I think it is our responsibility to make it easier for somebody else or to help somebody else uh, get theirs, um, because that's what we've been afforded. Uh, so I just I just think it's our responsibility. Sure. Hit us with a couple of the Carla pearls for those of the folks listening that don't know them. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you three of the most important pearls out of Expect to Win, my first book, and and one of the most important out of my second book, Strategize to Win. The most important pearl out of Expect to Win is perception is the co-pilot to reality. How people perceive you will directly impact how they deal with you. And that was a big aha for me, uh, Molly. And the the real critical uh, power in that pearl is understanding that you have the ability to train people to think about you in the way that you want them to think about you. The second pearl that is most important out of that book is the authenticity pearl. When I wrote the book, I had no intentions of writing about authenticity, but during the time I was writing the book, I kept running into people and audiences that were struggling with, how do I bring my real self into my work? And most people had the belief that they could not. So I, I, that's what made me write that chapter. And the real power in that pearl is that your authenticity is your distinct competitive advantage. Nobody can be you the way that you can be you. You and I are both, you know, what I'd like to think of as great speakers, but I cannot be Molly, right? And I don't think Molly thinks she can be Carla. We're both great in our own right. And there may be things that I see that Molly does that I I like that I might want to put in my tool chest, but I'm going to have to own it the way Carla can own it. And if you see something that I'm doing that you admire, you like, maybe you want to put it in your tool chest, but you're going to have to do it the way Molly would do it. The minute you try to do it like me, or I try to do it like you, it's going to be less than, because I cannot out Molly Molly. I can't do it. (laughs) I I can't out Carla Carla. Right. And that's what people don't get, that, that you are your own competitive advantage. And then the last pearl from the first book, that uh, I think is really critical is the importance of taking risks, especially now, Molly, because we are in an environment where nobody can call what the future looks like. And we all, we all have an opportunity to reimagine and to put our imprimatur on the future. So you got to make sure that you can fire up your appetite for taking risks and go do that. Don't wait to have someone dictate to you what things should look like and you're just a taker. And you didn't participate when you had the power 
to do so. And then the pearl that I think is most critical um, in my second book, Strategize to Win, is this concept between performance currency and relationship currency. And as you know, Molly, I don't often give gender-specific advice, but here's where I will delineate. So often when I've seen women try to get through, as they call it, the proverbial glass ceiling, which I you know, prefer not to give a lot of credence to, um, just because if you do, you get preoccupied with thinking that it's there and you, you convince yourself you can't get through it, and which I don't, which I don't believe. But I find women get right there and then they don't push through, not because they're not capable or able, it's because they have not invested in the relationships that are going to push them through. And, and because they get right to the top, three candidates are being considered. And what gets said in that room, oh, they're all really good. They're all really good. We can't make a bad choice. They're all really good. But Sam or Tom and whoever's speaking on Sam or Tom's behavior has a relationship with them. And Sarah doesn't have the relationship. And it's that the fact that somebody knows Sam or knows Tom well enough to speak informally and powerfully on their behalf. And they don't know Sarah like that because Sarah has been so busy delivering the results and not investing in the relationships. And that relationship currency is critical when you get more senior because of that assumption of equity in capabilities. And you know, as well as I do, there may be a huge difference in capabilities between the three, but there's an assumption of equity at that point. And it's the relationship that pierces the veil. What What's a leadership lesson, Carla, you wish you knew earlier in your life, in your career? Yes, I'll tell you, that that's an easy one. I heard Meg Whitman say when she was CEO of eBay, she said she realized that one of her most important things, uh, one of her most important roles as a CEO was to make sure that the right person was in the right seat at the right time. And, you know, I didn't realize how critical people decisions and timing around people really were, you know, and her, her example was powerful. She said, you know, Randy might have been the guy that created this new product or this new thing, but recognizing that Randy was not the guy to take it from creation to a multi-billion dollar opportunity was my job as a CEO. And it was my job to get Randy out of that seat and get the right person in that seat that could take it there. As a po- And for me, translation, Molly, was instead of having the emotion around it that, oh, Randy created it. This is his baby. I, 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 you know, maybe I can give him another shot or maybe I can get him some help or maybe I can do blah, blah. When it's so clear, Randy is just not the guy. But, but you, you, keep, you keep wanting to keep Randy in that seat for all of these other reasons, which when you, when you boil down to, uh, it's an emotional reason. And I thought a lot about that uh, because I do think culturally it has influenced me as a leader because, you know, often, especially growing up, you heard as a person of color, you didn't get as many chances as everyone else. So, you know, don't, don't, don't blow your chance. Don't blow your chance. And so you always sort of think subconsciously, man, I wish people would give me a shot. I wish people would give me a chance. So I think that earlier in my leadership journey, I definitely was deferential towards giving people another shot, giving people another chance. Because I always somehow deep inside wished I would be afforded another chance. Whether or not I needed it or not, I, I just wish if I had messed up, I would think I had another shot. But, you know, it was drilled into us that we did not. What were the kind of questions you'd ask yourself or that you ask yourself now, right, to get clear on, you know what, I'm in a space that's driving this decision from an emotional perspective versus uh, the perspective that I need to be approaching that one to make an objective decision, right? Like, what are the questions you ask yourself to gain that clarity? Yes. I'll ask myself things like, okay, how many times has this transpired? What do I know about this person, about their strengths? What do I know about this person as their weakness? What's the upside if I give them another shot? What's the downside uh, if I give them another shot? And really think through that. And I try to put structure around it. Okay, if I make this decision and this is what I'm looking for in this period of time, if this doesn't happen, I am committed to making a change. Yes, yes, committed go forward. What was there a rough patch right in your career, Carla, or a time maybe where you felt, you know, people listening like oh, this lady's unbelievable, right? Like her confidence, her her passion, 
her, her commitment to all of it, it's, 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 it's awesome. Was there ever a time where that slipped, right? And how did you get yourself back on track and, and, and maybe lessons you learned kind of inside of that moment or those moments? Yeah, I will tell you that probably six or seven years into my career was where there was probably the roughest patch. I'd say I had a rough patch very early on when I was sort of having this aha around all of these early pearls. <laughs> so call it that that year two, three was like, whoo, right? And then now you get to that, what you call that middle middle level of your career, especially in investment banking is kind of happening between six uh, year six and year eight. Um, you know, there were there were a number of things that that happened. And at that point, I had to make the decision where you say, okay, are you going to buckle in and go forward and take these lessons um, and, and turn them into gold? Or are you going to say, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. It's just too hard. And I will tell you that what gave me clarity uh, was my spirituality, Molly. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. I, I kind of withdrew and went deep into prayer and counted on God to clarify, and and He did. And once and once I thought it was clear, then you know I moved forward. Now that was that was earlier, I would say, in my spiritual walk. So even if I made the decision to go forward, I can't tell you that I didn't come back and question it the next time. You know, I kind of hit the wall. But it it was great that I at least gotten the clarity and I could bring myself back to the clarity and say, walk on um, and just look at disappointment or rough patches as additional pearls that I was collecting along the way. And, and what I'd like to encourage your listeners to think about is sometimes there are hard lessons or trials that come our way because that's the only way that we're going to get the message. Right. And you know how sometimes you say, oh, well, I would have gotten the message if it had been delivered a little bit better. No, you wouldn't. have. No, you wouldn't. Have. If it had come lighter, if it had come all in a nice bowl and delivered to you, uh, you, you would have missed it. We miss so many cues in life and so many signs. We just miss them. And especially pre pandemic, when we were all running at 80 miles an hour, we missed a lot. But because we've been forced to slow down now, now we can hear better. Now we can see the signs as they're, now we can get the clues as they've been delivered uh, to us. And, you know, my my worry is that in about three months, you know, we're going to go back from this nice 35, 40 mile an hour pace that we're on now, that we're going to all go back to 80, 85 again. Um, so I'm going to try real hard not to have that happen. I won't tell you I won't get to 60, but I'm going to try hard not to get back to 80. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I mean, I'm a big, you know, Ryan Holiday fan and he writes great stuff and, and uh, he's a friend and he talks about how stillness is the key, right? That we learn so much in these moments of stillness and I couldn't agree more. Carla, we've done a ton of leadership events together over the years. And, and at every every single one of them, right, you and I both still get asked the same question, right, about work-life balance, right? We get it at, at, almost every time. You're an executive. You're a wife. You're a mother. You're a gospel singer, by the way, for people that don't know. You're an author. I'm sure I'm missing some things here. But h- how do you think about the que- that question, right, Carla, around balance? And, and has it changed for you over time? I mean, you have a young daughter. Yeah, I have two now. Yeah, you do? Oh, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I got, I got a new one right in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, I will tell you, that's one thing I'm very proud of, Molly, is that uh, I walk my own talk, especially when it comes to balance. And even before I became a mother almost six years ago, I will tell you that um, I would say to women the following. First of all, balance is about making sure you have joy uh, in your life every day, whatever that thing is that brings you joy. When popular business press talks about uh, work-life balance, they're really talking about work family, not work life. So you need to find those things that bring you joy every day and have some of that in your day every day. Sometimes it's going to be your, your work, whatever your occupation is. Sometimes it will be your family. Sometimes it won't. But, you know, maybe it's going to be running today. Maybe it's going to be working on a new song today. Maybe it's going to be mentoring somebody. But whatever brings you joy, you need to have that in your day every day because that is what creates balance. When work is not all what you'd like it to be, the fact that you have that thing somewhere on your calendar that day, that's going to be your driver. When your family is driving you crazy, the fact that you have that thing 
uh, whatever's going to bring you joy in there, that's going to help you get through it. You're just waiting to get to that moment in your day. That is really what balance is all about. And being able to manage it all, all the different things, you know, Molly, the parent, Molly, the partner, Molly, the speaker, Molly, the businesswoman, Molly, the coach, being able to add, being able to manage all of those is it's around prioritizing what needs to get done in each of those roles and asking yourself, where can I get some help? Where can I get some leverage? If there's somebody in your household, like a babysitter, a nanny, a caretaker, somebody that can help you around that that day or in part of the day, why don't you let them help you do that? If there's somebody that can help you manage your household and you have the resources to do that, why don't you let them help you do that? If there's somebody that's going to help you organize the people that you serve in your occupation, i.e. having the right team to help you do some things, why don't you do that? So that way you don't pull back on those things that you would like to influence and that you can influence. You don't have to touch it in order to influence it. That's how I think about it. All right, we end with rapid fire. So I'm going to just hit you with a couple quick ones and you uh, tell me what comes up. All right. Mm -hmm. Introvert or extrovert? <laughs> extrovert. <laughs> a book you recommend most often? Ah, yes. Transform Your Life by Dr. Reverend Barbara King. She just passed away, but it transformed the way that I pray. What's your morning routine? Um, I have a series of, of five periodicals that I read um, that are all spiritual in nature, whether it's, you know, the Daily Word, um, whether it's, um, I'm, I'm pulling them out now for you, the Daily Bread, 60 Days of Prayer, the Upper Room. That's my morning routine is that I read all of those to get myself settled and centered and thoughtful um, and where I can really feel the power that is within. And then I go. That's awesome. What brings you joy? Uh, being able to help other people and help people find or get theirs. That does bring me joy. Not to mention my two girls. There you go. Boil your success down to three words if you can. What are those? Spirit. Uh, no, I'll make it easy. Knowledge of spirit. Mm, look at you. Right off the tongue like that, girl. What are you reading, watching, and listening to right now? Um, I am listening to um, some John Legend. I'm listening to Yolanda Adams. And I'm listening to Cece Winans uh, in, in particular. And I am watching, I just finished, <laughs> this is funny. Um, I, I, I love like drama and crime, crime shows and that sort of thing. So there used to be this show on stars called Power and uh, they just had the derivative of it, um, which is now the sun called Ghosts. And uh, I just binge watched that over the weekend. So that's listening uh, no, that's listening, reading, watching. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That's good. What is success to Carla Harris? What is it to you? Yeah. Success really is about enabling others to get theirs. That, that is the driver. So the show's called Game Changer. So what game changer or, or who as a game changer inspires you and why? Wow. There's, there's a lot. There are a lot of people, but I'm going to give you, um, Two CEOs that, that, well, oh boy. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I can think. <laughs> you can give me a couple if you need to, Carla. You're so, I mean, I love listening to you share. Yeah, I can think. Let me give you, let me give you five that are alive and two that are passed on. The, the three that are alive that continue to inspire me a lot are Ursula Burns, Ken Chenault, and Ken Frazier all for very, very different reasons. And John Mack and James Gorman, I list them last because obviously that it could be, you could be seen as self-serving because they're, they're both, uh, you know, Mack is the former CEO of Morgan Stanley and Gorman is the current CEO and they've done different things and have inspired me differently. And, and I'll tell you one of the things I heard Gorman say, um, you know, a while ago that I talk about all the time in my speeches that I heard him say that, as the CEO, he focuses on only those things that the CEO can focus on, that if there's anything else on his list that anybody else on his team can do, it should not be on his list. Um, and translation in my mind, Molly, was, OK, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And for those of us who are type A personalities, because we can, we will. Right. Especially if you're a person like me who thinks they have a lot of capacity, you just take it on. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't because you should leave that white space, if you will, for 
innovative thinking and for creating. And if you're always executing, you don't have space to create. So that was, that's something that has really stuck in my mind. And, and Max, you know, empathy and, and accountability and uh, decisiveness were something that I noted as I was, as I like to say, a little girl in the business, because I grew up obviously professionally at Morgan Stanley and sort of watching him in my earlier days were the, some of the things that stood out. You know, he, he made himself available and accessible for his people. I'll never forget when my mother passed away, he made his way down to the sales and trading floor, asked me to step off the floor, went back into my office, which was in the back and said, how you doing? And I'll never forget that because that was really something that struck with me that he took the time to, you know, to come because he knew I was close to my mother to say, Hey, how you doing? Um, and I thought to myself, mm, as a leader, I got to remember, I have to remember to do that. Um, and then, you know, obviously Ursula Burns and, and, and Ken Chenault and Ken Frazier, modern day CEOs have been transformative and who've been leaders in their own right and who have managed through and around you know, crises to have organizations emerge in stellar form. And then the two that have passed on that stick in my mind is Bernard Tyson, who was chairman and CEO um, of Kaiser Permanente, and Vernon Jordan, who just passed away a couple months ago. Uh, again, you know, men that I watch from afar, and Bernard I had the privilege to work a lot with. Um, and, you know, to see how they interacted with people, how they led without obviously leading if that it makes any sense. They just encourage you to follow because they were. That's inspiring. And they're inspiring. That's, I tell you what, I mean, you, you sold me on the seven or eight that you just rattled off. Right. I, uh, and you've given our listeners more to chew on, which is awesome. Carla, I'll, I'm sure I'll see you on an airplane in a hallway, in a lobby, on a stage uh, sometime soon. And I'm looking forward to that. You are you're the best. Me too, Molly. I will be happy to give you a big hug, honey. I can't wait. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from our conversation. Number one. Balance is about joy. I love how Carla reframed the work-life balance conversation. Balance is about finding joy in every day. This was a way of thinking about balance that I hadn't heard before, but to me it's really, it's really powerful. Number two, we need a sponsor, not a mentor. She talks about how these are so different. Who is speaking up for you in the rooms that you aren't in. This is really practical advice for anyone navigating the next step of their career. Number three, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Amen. As a type A personality, I totally get what she means by this, right? It's so important to build white space into your day because that's where deep thinking, creativity, and and innovation thrive. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.